Hello everyone. A theme that's been quite predominant in my life over the last two to three months has been that of service. I've been quite fortunate with being so-called locked up in a place like this, um, a place called Varsana, an ashram just outside of Bogota, Colombia. And so I wanted to offer something today because service has been a conscious thought on my mind for the recent um, time that I've spent here. And I ask myself, how can I offer my gifts to the world? Now, this synchronized with an event or well, a voluntary event over the last week where I decided to voluntarily stop speaking. I took a vow of silence. Um, and beside a lot of the introspection that I had during that week, when I came out of the vow of silence, probably the most powerful message that struck me was that I have a voice. And it's a gift to be able to use this voice. And so... In saying that, I wanted to take this opportunity to share some of the energy that I've been so fortunate enough to be a part of here at the ashram. And I wanted to share a story that I recently wrote in a more meditative format. So I've never done this before. And frankly, um, I've never seen a story like meditation been done before. So this is somewhat of an experiment and I'm hoping it goes according to what I think it can have as an effect. So we'll call this a guided story meditation. So if you would like to follow this guided story meditation, I kindly ask you to get comfortable. You can lay down, you can sit in a Sukhasana position as I am right now, but most importantly, I need you to close your eyes. So let us close our eyes right now. And focus on the life force that keeps us here today and every day. Our breathing. As you breathe, listen as the air travels through your nostrils, down your windpipe, into your lungs, and fills you with life. All you need to do right now is relax. You can relax every muscle in your entire body, from your feet to your calves to your entire legs, your lower back, your upper back, your neck, your arms, your hands, your fingers, your neck. And a little game I like to play when I meditate is looking for muscles that are still tense 
And so you'll probably find that your jaw is still tense. You'll probably find that your eyebrows are still tense. You might find that your tongue is still tense. You can let that just rest. All you are doing is breathing. Now you may be in a small room, in a living room, in a garden, but the probability is that you are in a lockdown situation, in a confined space. But now that your eyes are closed, your mind, or should I say your consciousness rather, is a vast, vast, vast field, an open space like the one behind me. It's infinite, eternal. It has no boundaries. Just picture this vast field with blades of grass. that are slowly, slowly swaying to the movement in the wind. Now I want you to picture yourself wearing a pair of shoes. And on that pair of shoes, you will find your name. And with your name, you will find all of your beliefs of who you are, who you are not, what you have done, what you have not done, what you like and what you don't like. Everything is contained in those shoes and you are wearing them right now. But for the next 10 to 15 minutes, I want you to slip those shoes off your feet. Now picture yourself taking those shoes off and placing them in a box. And you will close that box and slowly place it in a cupboard or anywhere you wish, but out of your sight. And for the next 10 minutes, you will not have to deal with what comes along with those shoes. You are pure consciousness. Now, we can use the power of our imagination. The beauty of our imagination is that we can use it to create worlds beyond that which we live in. And so now, I invite you to imagine a sliver of the retreating golden sun seeped through the curtain behind her. Particles of glowing dust danced, suspended in space and time along rays of light in a universe of their own utterly oblivious to her world, and yet she was completely absorbed by theirs. A faint, unrecognizable mumble reverberated in the black background, yet she was lost in the waltzing dust. Once again, another mumble, only this time it grew louder. Amy, are you sure you want to do this? The dust particles faded out in a blur, and Amy found herself in a room sitting opposite a man in a navy blue turtleneck wagging his pen between two fingers against his notebook that lay on his crossed legs. The room looked and smelt of opulence, with an abundance of gold trimmings and pine-green velvet couches. A wall-to-wall -wall library filled to the brim with books covered the entire space behind him, each book so tightly placed on the shelves that not a single sheet of paper more could have fit between them. A sweet aroma of philosophical poetry blended with the scent of old maho mahogany furniture. What a big room it was. 
with ceilings so tall that the light that seeped in through the window could not reach its surfaces. And yet the room was shrinking fast, caving in on her as her consciousness took note of where she was and why. Yes, this is the only way, Amy replied as her whole body was invaded uncontrollably by a wave of terror. Okay, then I'm going to have to remind you again that this is the new technology and that we have never tried this before in this set of t circumstances, Mark replied in a stern voice. Amy, shook by the gravity of what was about to take place, intentionally worked to slow the pace of her tachycardic breathing. She filled her lungs with what felt like diminishing air, belly first, then mid, and finally upper chest. before she released a continued and elongated exhale down to the very last molecule of air in her windpipe. Her gaze slowly steered toward her left, past the beam of light to a closed door. Just three inches of maroon painted wood stood between her and him. She could not fathom looking at his wretched face again. Amy, I need for you to focus with me now. This is how this is going to work. On your command, we will let him inside. He will sit in the seat to your left, tightly secured. Then, we will place the helmets on both of you, and I will then ask you to both close your eyes in a guided meditation, and we will travel back to that fateful day together. You should know that we are in this together. Mark paused with a slow inhale in and out. You should also know that you are the bravest person that I have ever met. I am ready. You can let him in now, Amy said in a steadfast voice while staring at the door. Mark signaled to the guard. As the door opened and faded away into the dark hallway behind the beam of golden light, the seconds grew longer and the dancing dust momentarily jerked back, inviting new particles into the luminous universe. She grinned at its very isness. Then with a sudden blow, a shadowy figure marched through the light, sending the universe into a tumultuous whirlwind. She remained staring at the aftermath as a scrawny old man in an orange jumpsuit entered the room. Steel shackles clanked between his ankles. He sat on the sofa chair beside her, face down at his knees. Mr. Fletcher, thank you for joining us. My name is Dr. Mark Twinnings, and I'm a medical psychologist here at UCL. In, accord in accordance with Statute 23C in your case, you were given the option of shortening your sentence by 20 years if you agreed to proceed with this procedure. The object of this procedure will be for you and Amy to relive the crime in your minds whilst connected to our new technology, Symponia. The helmets you see in front of you have the ability of transferring feelings. Helmet Beta in front of you will be able to receive what Helmet Alpha is feeling to about 97% accuracy according to our tests. Are you still in accordance with this procedure? Fletcher nodded but did not lift his head. Mr. Fletcher, I'm going to need you to look at me in the eye and give me a firm yes or no answer. Fletcher rolled his bloodshot eyes up and inched his head slightly higher. Yes, Doc, I agree to all of your fucking bullshit code. Mark's eyebrows twitched higher Thank you for the kind words. We shall now proceed. Can you both please wear the helmets that are placed on the table in front of you? The thin, glossy white metallic frame slipped onto their heads and sent simultaneous goosebumps down both of their spines. The helmets were gelid, so cold that you would think it were impossible to transmit feelings through them. Now, if you could both please close your eyes. I want you both to focus only on your breath and repeat after me with every breath in and out. So hum, hum sa. So hum, hum sa. So hum, hum sa. So hum, hum sa. They repeated the mantra again and again. Now I want you to picture yourself in this very room with every object in it including myself. With every inhale, you will acknowledge an object, and with every exhale, it will fall away. Until you are only left with your body, and when you reach your body, that will fall away too. 
And when your body fades away, you will be left with pure consciousness. Your consciousness has no affiliation with our material world. It can move between space and time indefinitely. So hum, hum sa. So hum, hum sa. They repeat it. Now let's take you both to that night. Mark's voice faded away with their bodies as they slipped back into the most pivotal moment of their lives. It's a tranquil night out on the dock. A bone-chilling mist hovers over the moist wooden planks, giving each lamppost a halo's glow. Seagulls gently squawk over the calm waters overpowered only by the crisp tap of Vincent's freshly shined dress shoes as he saunters along the path with his wife, Amy. Oh, Vincent, I'm so grateful for this night, the flowers, the letter, your presence. I'm going to miss you so dearly. My darling, do not fear for this is a necessary step in our story. One of my favorite writers once said that love knows not its own depth until the hour of separation. It is here and now where we swim together to the darkest place on our ocean floor. I don't know what is more beautiful, the words, or that you always know exactly when to say them. And which writer do you speak of? Why, Khalil Gibran, of course. Oh darling, could you recite some of his work? Amy shouts as she skips and hops out in front of Vincent where there is a lamp post that is flickering sporadically on and off. Vincent smiles as he takes a mental picture of a moment his heart will savor on his travels overseas. Amy stands under the flickering lamp and turns to face him, out of breath and in love. I only remember one verse that has stuck with me from the same book, and it isn't all that romantic. Darling, if you remember it, I want to remember it with you. Amy says with the same soft smile she had been wearing all night. Then, almost entirely expected, the flickering light over her head goes out and she is no longer visible. All right, but first come to me, darling. I can't see you. No. You walk toward, toward me and speak your beautiful words. Okay, if you insist. Vincent takes on a serious demeanor and stands tall, resolute like a general about to give his army a speech. He squints his eyes and clenches his jaw as he begins walking towards the dark spot on the dock. <clears throat> In this chapter, Khalil speaks of crime and punishment, and I quote, And if any of you would punish in the name of righteousness and lay the axe onto the evil tree, let him see to its roots, and verily he will find the roots of the good and the bad, the fruitful and the fruitless, all entwined together in the silent heart of the earth. And the light flickers back on for a millisecond and Vincent freezes, Vincent freezes in his steps. He is unsure if what he saw was real or just his mind short-circuiting a dreadful image. Amy's eyes swelling out of her sockets with a palm over her mouth and fingers sinking into her cheeks. Don't fucking move. A man grunts under his breath from the darkness. Vincent jerks forward. You stay right there. Fletcher steps out of the darkness with Amy in a chokehold and a nine-inch kinship knife hovering over her. He is barefoot, dressed in ripped jeans and a t-shirt to match. Please, 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 sir, this isn't worth it. We will give you what you want. So then, give it to me. The longer I wait, the more impatient I get. Vincent empties his pockets and inches his way toward them slowly with his arms held high above his head as Fletcher loses his, his grip on Amy in a spasm she jumps out of his arm Fletcher scrambles to grab her as she sprints away but Vincent dives in between them and the blade tears through his neck's artery Amy wails in despair as she falls to the floor placing the palms of her hands on his neck blood gushing through her fingers painting the dock in death Fletcher disappears into the darkness. Fletcher collapsed to the floor, bawling and hyperventilating in agony as he felt the warmth of Vincent's embrace and the bottomless ocean of love that he gave her. He felt each and every kiss, each and every infinite smile. It was not guilt that tore him apart, 
but her own beating heart drained dry of its, of its blood. Enough. This is enough. My pain is mine and mine alone. Take this helmet off this man. Mark nodded at the guard who lifted the helmet off his head. Fletcher curled into a fetal position and continued to weep. Now give it to me. Amy, this is not part of the procedure. I want to wear his helmet, she screamed. If you do this, it is completely at your own risk. Do you understand? I want to wear his helmet, Mark. Do not question me. But where do you want to go? We need to guide the meditation somewhere. I want us to go where his love turned to hate, where his courage turned to fear, where he lost all hope. And once again, Mark guided them through a meditation. Only this time they traveled to the core of Fletcher's pain. And she felt it. She felt it all. She felt a paralyzing pain of a wound deeper than that left by her dying husband, deeper than her own bones. An open wound so deep it ripped through her naked soul. She felt the pain of her own flesh dying from starvation. She felt the pain of her best friend getting raped and murdered in front of her. She felt the pain of her kin beating her senseless with an iron rod. She felt a mortal desperation, a hopeless duality forged upon her by an unfair and cruel world. And she fell to the ground with her forehead at Fletcher's feet. And she grabbed his shackled ankles. Amy, please, be careful near him, Mark shouted. Amy stood to her knees and looked deep into Fletcher's blood-red blood eyes and said, Vincent never got to finish what he was reciting to me, but I looked it up. And you judges who would be just, what judgment pronounce you upon him, who though honest in the flesh yet is a thief in spirit? What penalty lay you upon him, who slays in the flesh yet is himself slain in the spirit? And it was there born between the tormented hearts the tormented tears and the torn hearts, a bridge. A bridge connecting through rays of understanding, shining light on that which danced between them. Okay, wherever you are right now, you've created a world. I've guided you to this world, but this world is your own. You've created this in your own mind. And I want you to take note that you can access this world, your imagination, Whenever you so wish, it is at your discretion. If you think you are trapped in a room, your consciousness has no boundaries and you can visit whenever you like. Now, I want you to focus on your breathing again. Deep inhales and long exhales out. I want you to start to wiggle your fingers and your feet to invite some blood into your muscles. And when you're ready, you can sit up and slowly, very, very slowly, you can open your eyes. So if you've come this far through this guided story meditation, I want to sincerely thank you for listening to the story. As I said, this is somewhat new for me. And I know that as a meditation, it was somewhat unorthodox because there are a few scenes in the story that are particularly violent, I would say. But if you look through the words that I'm speaking, there's a message of compassion. And although it might seem 
quite radical to try to understand someone that's killed your husband or your wife. If you think to a lesser extent in your life, there is almost definitely someone that you have a dispute with, a family member, a friend, a colleague. And if you just took five minutes to take off your shoes and try to put on their shoes, understand what they might be thinking, feeling, what they've been through in their life. And you might see that there's a place where you guys can meet, a bridge that you guys can build. So once again, I want to thank you. If you enjoyed this meditation, I'll kindly ask you to share it with someone that you think might need it, or just share it, period. Or you don't have to share it at all. And I'd love to start a conversation with you guys about the story. If you'd like to comment below on this video and let me know if you would wear these helmets and try this new technology called Symponia. How would you use it? Um, who would you use it with if you'd like to share? I'd be happy to start a conversation with you guys. So once again, thank you guys very much. Coming to you from an ashram here in Colombia. Sending you guys a lot of love and light. May you be well.